The Glass CEO, an outlet, a channel, a platform dedicated to cast glass. Let's do the YouTube thing. Can you please subscribe to the channel, like the videos, and if you're happy to do so, share them. So today I'm joined by Johnny Sleepy Moran. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a pleasure. Here. It's a pleasure. So today we're at your studio. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us where we are? Uh, we're sitting in Ghent Glass, which is a glass studio just outside of the center in Ghent in Belgium. Uh, I founded the studio about eight years ago with some other people, but it's kind of evolved into like from a big public studio to more of our personal studio where we're making our own work. I'm making my own work with my partner. Uh, she's making her own work as well here, and we do some workshops and some events. Amazing, amazing. Well, thank you for inviting us. Uh, we're going to run through quite a few questions and answers, hopefully get a bit of your backstory and everything today. So. Um, Obviously, you don't sound as though you're from Belgium. I presume you're American. Can you tell us a bit about your background, just where you were born, what your upbringing was like, what your kind of hobbies were and things like that? Just give us a bit of background about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I'm originally from Philadelphia area. Uh, I grew up in yeah, Lansdowne, which is just outside of Philadelphia, south, okay. south Philly. And uh, I lived there until I was about 10. Um, and then we moved to Delaware when I was like, my father had gotten a job in Delaware. Uh, we moved there, which is like an hour south, so that's like a 45-minute yep. drive probably, actually. Uh, moved down to Delaware, and uh, shortly after we moved there is when my father passed away. So it kind of put a big, yeah, I don't want to say like, a, like a, a black cloud over living in Delaware. And basically, I went to high school, like I went to grade school and high school in Delaware. Um, yeah, I was a normal, whatever, youth, I guess. Uh, yeah. And then when I was 18, I went back to Philly, and I went to Tyler School of Art, which is... Um, Art school in North North Philadelphia, and uh, there I was studying painting, drawing, illustration, and I really was not like finding my place there. I was uh -huh. not very happy with it. It's yeah. like not my thing. And then I kind of accidentally took a glass class. Okay. So uh, I had a resident assistant, like a re resident, whatever, an RA. I don't know what they're. It's all like a placement. Yeah, no, no, it was, it was actually the person who was like in charge of our dorms. All right. So they were like helping with, uh, <clears throat> yeah, whatever. And she was just like, oh, you should take a glass blowing class. It's really cool. I didn't even know what the hell it was. And I took my first class and I was hooked. And I was really lucky. It was like, um, <clears throat> I had a really good teacher then who was a grad student. And he kind of like kept me in the program because I was not really happy. I was also working night shift at UPS at the time. Okay. So I was going to school during the day and then working at, working at night. Yourself. Yeah, right. and like I slept on Wednesdays, you know, it was like my sleep day. <laughs> but I was pretty much like a narcolept. Like I would go to, this, to, the, to the hot shop and sit down and fall asleep. And if I didn't have this teacher who like saw any potential in me or whatever, like I probably would have dropped out. But he really? kind of pulled me in, his name's Shea Rhodes. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give a little shout out. He pulled me in and kind of really got me engaged. And then I ended up being a teacher assistant for John Clark, who was the head of the pr program there. And yeah. him and we have like a lasting friendship now. So it was really, for me, life-changing. So he really saw something in you and saw a talent. I guess so, yeah. Or he was just a nice guy in general, would have done it for anybody, but he definitely <laughs> did it for me. <laughs> Well, let, let's go with he saw a talent. Yeah. Let's go with the sorry talent. No, that, that, that's really good. I'm, I'm glad you gave us that background because one of the questions I was going to ask you is kind of like, you know, how do you get involved in art? How do you, was it always a passion of yours? Obviously, you said you went and yeah, so you I, weren't engaging with other, other mediums like painting, drawing, but you found a passion in glass. Yeah, I was, uh, I was really into comic books when I was younger, so I was, did a lot of drawing, like illustration comic books. I started getting into painting probably like when I was 16 or something. I took a painting workshop somewhere. Yeah. And like everybody was like wanted to be a surrealist painter, you know, it was like the big thing. Everybody loved Dolly at the time, so yeah. I also did. And uh, yeah, it was something I was trying to, to figure out. I, I didn't know what it mean to be a professional artist until yeah. like probably a couple of years ago, actually. But like, uh, no, it was like this dream of being, you know, one of the, being one of the, the, the greats, I guess. And then, yeah. And then, yeah, the reality kicks in, you start doing it, and you realize there's so much more to the art world than how, if you can make art, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. kind of irrelevant. And obviously almost. today we're gonna focus a lot on, probably more about glass, because obviously this is what you're predominantly known for. Just as a, as a bit of a question, do you, do you ever find yourself going back to anything? Now, now you're so established in glass, have you ever thought about going back to painting, pottery, other forms of mediums it, it, does that even interest you anymore well I still I use a lot of mixed media in my work already so 
like I make these glass components, glass parts, and I go back and use a lot of medium. So I'm pretty satisfied by having the ability to do a lot of different yeah. things. So I like I feel like glass is kind of like my day job in a way, like yeah. as the way that like I, uh, a lot of things I create that are only in glass are much more like, um, yeah, they're they're not the the large sculptures that I I also like I prefer to make or I try to make more often, but they're the ones that kind of like keep me yeah keep me afloat and everything. So I do do use a lot of a lot of mediums. So I'm always yeah always looking for more things to learn too. So amazing, but not pottery. So how long was your kind of that that course that that educational period where you were. The in RA glass. And, and in glass. What what was the is that is that like a two year thing, a three year thing, or no? So when I went, it would have been a four year program, but a lot of times I was going for my BFA, which is a Bachelor of Fine Arts, yeah. and almost everybody who was in that program was doing a four and a half or five year program, yep. just because to get all the the classes class work done, and uh, I did four years, but. At the end of my, in my, going into my last year, I couldn't get my financial aid sorted out. Right. So I ended up kind of going to school, like, I want to say illegally, but kind of illegally. Like, I was there taking classes, but I wasn't getting any credit for it. <laughs> so I ended up having to go back in 2006. And then in that 2006, I finished my degree. I finished up my last semester. Oh, I ended up doing a year. So I did four and a half years, but spread out over 10 years. So, right. yeah. So in, in that type of period, where would you say you go from student to saying, I'm, I'm, I mean, do you class yourself as qualified or do you just say, hey, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm going into art, I'm now responsible for myself? Did, did you kick straight in working for yourself or did you, did you do any time working for anybody in, in glasses to like help fund yourself until you could get established and own your own studio? Yeah, so when I, while I was going to school, I worked for a couple of glass artists. Like I said, I worked UPS for a while too. Yeah. Um, side note, that's how I got the name Sleepy. The nickname Sleepy was in my first semester of glass when I was going to class and falling asleep. Uh, I understand. That, okay. that became my nickname. So I've had that my entire glass career, which is 25 years. So there's still people that know me as Sleepy and until doing Blown Away, uh, probably didn't know my real name. So <laughs> um, no, but I, I, yeah, so it, it's hard to say. Like I, when I, I didn't feel like I was an artist right after I graduated because there, you, you don't really like it's not like all of a sudden you make money or something. It's not like yeah. you start having shows and you start selling work. So yeah, the, yeah, immediately I was working a lot of odd jobs. Um, I worked at like a toy store. I worked at like a porn shop. I worked for a glass blower. Is, is that taking things and exchanging it for money or is it selling the videos and DVD? Selling the videos and DVDs, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just a, I was a clerk uh, at both of those places. I was a manager at the, the toy store, a clerk at the, the porn shop. But uh, I did like odd jobs, like construction work as well. Um, and then I did some glass blowing. Like I worked for a glass blower for a couple of years, mm -hmm. doing production work for him, and then I was teaching workshops at night. So it was kind of like a lot of odd jobs to keep it afloat. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and then I, I so I don't like that. And during all of this time, I don't think I ever really felt like I was established enough. So I ended up going back to school. I went to China and lived in China for a year. Okay. Uh, taught English in wow. 2004, 2005. Um, the guy that I was working for, Blowing Glass, he ended up getting sick and had to close his business. So I, like, like that, I was out of work. Right. And uh, at the time, there wasn't a lot of glass blowing in Philly. There was a little bit, like yeah. not like there is now. There was a little bit. So it wasn't easy to find a job. Yeah. And uh, ended up working for a metal fabrication shop for a little while, which is now this huge design fabrication shop. Amazing. And it started as a military fabrication shop. Um, so the passion and desire has always kind of kept you going. Yeah. Obviously, at I know what it's like when you're trying to start establishing yourself, whether it's a, an artist, a business, you've, you've got to do things and you've got to make moves and do side hustles to. Yeah, there's it. no, there's no path. So it's all like, a, it's all like you're figuring it out as you're going. Yep. And I was kind of just jumping to one thing to the next until I, until I think I went to grad school. And when I went to grad school, I haven't had like a, I haven't had a job for someone else directly other than myself since yep. I went to do my MFA. So just, just talk us through just roughly on the timeline. So we've got, so you're leaving the US, you're going to China. That was roughly what, 2000? So I left the US around 2004, I believe. And I came back to the States in 2005. Yep. And then in 2006, I did my last year of my degree. So I took that time between 2001 and 2006, I was yep. not in school. Yep. So in 2006, I finished my degree. And then in 2007 to 2009, I worked for a, uh, a fabricator who made hot shop equipment. Okay. 
And that's actually where I started kind of really getting into the sculpting more. Like I was already doing sculpting and stuff when I was in school. Like I was learning mm -hmm. my, I was learning the basics. Yep. Uh, conceptually, I was doing a lot of stuff, but I wasn't quite feeling like I was a, an established sculptor. But it was like during that time frame that the guy that I worked for was doing this specific way of sculpting. Then I started to make strides. Yep. And I think people were noticing. So and initially like, when you were kind of studying and you'd, you'd finished that period, were you, what were you, what type of things were you glass blowing? Was it like commercial items for yeah. people to retail and sell? Yeah, I was working for other people. So I was making their work uh, for them or like with them. Like I was assisting on making it or I was making it. Um, yeah. And then in my like lunch breaks or whatever, I would do some, uh, or like whenever I had time, I would make some little skulls. Actually, it was a big thing I started with. Yep. Just things that I could kind of like experiment with and learn the process with. Okay. And most of them were rather small, just because it's like uh, I didn't have a torch, which is a life-changing thing for me. Yep. Um, because they really weren't, they weren't a lot of them around at the time. So like not a lot of people had these torches that you see everywhere now. Yes. Um, so I was like working almost entirely out of furnace heat. So I was limited by that, yep. uh, sort of, um, at, well enough. And then in that, like when I, when I started working for the, the, the fabricator, he had a hot shop, so I could use the right. studio in the evening. And that's when I really experimented with, he had a torch as well, so I experimented with really getting into realistic sculpture. Yep. And that was in like 2009-ish. So really, would you say that, because obviously we're gonna talk a little bit about the lines that you design and sort of like some of the signature things that you're known for. But so are you saying really the kind of like the technique came and you kind of like are indeed that and perfected that technique before the characters came there or were the characters something that you already had in the back of your mind? So I was always making, yeah, yeah, no, I was always making work that was figurative in a lot of ways. It was very basic, like some of the early figurative stuff was like a very basic blown form. So it'd be like a ball, which we learned to blow on yep. top of a cylinder and that was a person yep. and they were bigger, but, and so yeah, no, they, they were, I was working with this kind of idea of persons, like people or personalities and mm -hmm. little figurative motifs with a lot of like stories behind them and a lot of storytelling and a lot of concepts like linked to social issues so that was always in my work okay. but like my I would say like my chops so like my hand skills and everything is what I really learned when I worked for production when yeah. I worked for somebody you really get to know glass <clears throat> and once I understood how glass worked more than I like I thought I did when I was in school but I didn't you know you don't know yeah. shit until you do I thought I did and then when I started to really develop my skills, I was able to do more with the glass and sculpting, and then that just snowballed. Yep. So the better I got at glass blowing, the better I got at sculpting. Yep. Um, the more I just could push what was possible, that I knew was yep. possible with the material, as far as timelines go, and the weight that I could carry, the, just every, every aspect of it. And also my, um, uh, like my, not get, I can't think of the word, when you're not, not getting tired, my, uh, I could work for longer without getting tired. Yeah, the, the, the duration of period you can put in, the, yeah. the longevity of the day. I think, that, I, th I think the longevity of not being tired when you've got to be self-motivated. I think self-motivated is probably the word. Yeah, you, yeah. You've got, to, you've got to feel that passion. You, it's coming from a place of the money secondary. Yeah, yeah. T tertiary maybe even. No, absolutely. Um, that and, and, and physically also being able to well, like... Th this is what I'm going to talk about. Endurance. We'll get to sort of like your inspiration and things like that. I think we're, we're starting to understand because one of the questions I was going to ask you was what was the spark? You, you've clearly covered that off and boxed that off. But one of the things I was going to talk about before we get into your actual work and the inspiration and how you develop that was the techniques you have developed because I that was the first time I was introduced to you was actually at one of your demonstrations mm -hmm. and you know it's like a gym workout marathon yeah for longer I mean you're working at high heat obviously with the, the raw materials and things but just the techniques plus when I first saw you you were working with a partner mm -hmm. making a conjoined sculpture yeah 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 and and it was bigger than it was supposed to be <laughs> right but, yeah. the, but the accuracy I mean, I, I profess to hopefully try and know a little bit about glass. What I saw you doing just, I know this is gonna sound wrong, but blew me away, which <laughs> obviously I'm not, I'm not trying to say that because of the show and everything, but it was mind blowing what you did. Mm -hmm. the, the, the actual, the effort that goes in, the energy, the technique, and when you see it, you know, starting finishing, I think you did a two and a half, two, I, I think I saw you, I think it must've been two hours straight mm -hmm. from start to finish. There was no real breaks in there mm -mm. because you can't, really break with yeah, yeah, yeah. what you're doing. You've got to keep the flow going. So I think I've got some footage of that. I might, inter you know, put a bit of that into this video sure. if that's okay yeah, to, yeah. 
just sort of like take everyone back to seeing just how you are doing it. And I, I think what blew my mind away was the actual, what you were creating, how it starts out. And you're not really even looking at sketches. You're not even referring back to something. So you've clearly pre-planned what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But like you just said, it got bigger than it should have done. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was like physical endurance watching you like spin these bars around and the glass on the end and going back into the furnace and back out of the furnace and things it was it, it was amazing so I'll, I'll put some of that footage in I, I think I've still got some of that recorded um, so your technique obviously clearly developed to a, mm -hmm. a very high level um, so going into like your inspiration what was kind of like the inspiration for the start of your characters? Because obviously I, I know you for the skulls, mm -hmm. but you've obviously got these big pieces as well, mm -hmm. these big statement pieces. So hopefully we can get some photography from you and mm -hmm. we'll put, that, put those in the video to show people other things that they may not know that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find your inspiration for work? What was the kind of like the initial trigger point for you? Uh, you know, like originally, I think it really came from like it stemmed from like I grew up in Philly, in Philadelphia, Philly, yeah. And there was a lot that years, the years that I was there, there was a lot of gun violence. There was a lot going on, and like I, I'm a '90s kid. Like I grew up during this political era of like hip hop, music. People were like movies. Everything was kind of anti-establishment. Yeah. There was a lot of political. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was a lot of politics and art. Yeah. So we were kind of like. I don't want to say angry, I don't think that's the right word, but frustrated. Yeah. People were showing it, and my work was driving from that. Like, I was really influenced by music, really influenced by pop culture. Pop culture being movies like, like Natural Born Killers, or like the like yeah. kind of... Um, Real cult classic yes. 90s films, which have never really been repeated since, probably. Exactly, they were really about mass media, too, from mass media production, you know, that's the side, but like about this, like, this problems in society, and that really, that's what really sparked it, I think. So my earliest work was about uh, like I, since I was from Philly, I lived in the suburbs as well, and like afterwards, and like a lot of the times like, people would talk about like violence is because of the neighborhood or whatever, which often they're referring to like because it's not white, and that's what they were saying like oh it's the neighborhood because it's a poor neighborhood. They meant a minority neighborhood, yeah. and I was like why well, from the suburbs is the same same things are happening just not the same way maybe. But so I made this work that was supposed to be about that like pointing out the kind of throwing it back in the face of people who would talk about it being like a minority issue when it's clearly a human issue. Yeah. Um, so that was where like the first pieces really started. Uh, and then from there, I think it's, it's, it became something for me that was like, I don't know if, I, I don't think I was doing it intentionally. Like now I look back on it and I see it, but I was like always kind of like twisting viewpoints of other people around. So like right. if somebody would say something like almost stereotypical or I want to say like, and like critical of someone else but not looking at themselves I would kind of flip that and use that again yep. so I've done that in a lot of pieces that are like they're kind of like a reflection of criticality but a critical reflection of criticality if that makes any so it's sense like a whole play on opinions yeah people. and also my own pre preconceived notions and like uh, like belief structures and really sp Specifically, I would say like dogmatic belief structures, not just a belief structure, but a dogmatic belief structure. And can I ask you a question, which may be on point, it may not. If you not become the artist, how do you think those type of ideas could have played out? I don't know what I would have done if I didn't become an artist. I think about that a lot sometimes because, uh, yeah, I have. No, I think I would end up in like a mental institution or something. <laughs> like I really don't know. I, I don't know what I would do with that because it's such an outlet. It's so cathartic, yeah. and. There would probably always be something, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but to like, I can't imagine like for me personally, like having it as a like a hobby or a weekend yeah. thing. It's yeah. it, it consumes my life, and yeah. uh, part of that's probably because it's become my business. <laughs> yeah. But it's like it, it really does, and I don't see it. I don't see another way that I could have survived, probably, which is strange to think. But like I, I say a lot, the glass saved my life, and I yeah. really mean that because I don't know where I'd be without it, and I don't have like a you know, like a drama, a traumatic story, a trauma story, like a lot of people do have coming from backgrounds that they had really glass saved their life. But for me, it yeah. feels like it was something if I didn't do, I don't know where I'd be. You kind of found your call in life to... Yeah, yeah, and it's been every... It's the, all the good things that have ever happened to me have happened to me because of that. So. Amazing, so. amazing. Slide indoors. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so carrying on from... You, you've covered quite in depth about the inspiration for your works. What would you say are from everything you've done, 
art-wise that is maybe commercially available or maybe not, it's a private piece you decide to keep or something. What would you say have been your favorite pieces? What would you say, do you look back at and say, I'm not happy with that, that was, you know, do you, do you see like a positive and a negative in your work in terms of, I don't, I don't mean about a statement, I mean in no. terms of how you view it. You're happy with stuff, you're not happy with stuff. No, often I think I'm very critical of what I make. So a lot of times if something stays around me long enough, it ends up getting improved or like, like I feel like something's not finished and I keep working on it a little bit and I go back and change something or I don't know, maybe just do something better that I've learned uh, over the years. So I try not to keep too much of my work around, <laughs> which is hard because I have a studio now, which like until recently I didn't have so much of my work around. Yep. Um, but that's something I've also been learning to let go of a little bit more. Yep. But I definitely have pieces that I look back on, like the, the New Times Roman, which is the Ronald McDonald piece. That's probably still one of my favorite sculptures. Yeah. I think conceptually it works really well. Um, it hits the points, like it's funny, it's serious, it's sad, it has all these moments. It's iconic, like it's something I've shown a lot of times, people Absolutely. recognize it immediately. Scale-wise, it's, it's, it's impeccable. I remember seeing it, it's just ginormous. I don't even know how long that took you to even make. I mean, it, just it, the... It's crazy, it didn't take me as long as I would have thought, but like it took me about three months to start from start to finish, but I spent probably a whole summer thinking through how I would do it. So that's yeah. one of the things I do a lot with my work is I figure out the, I, I create a problem, a big problem for myself when I have an idea, <laughs> and then I figure out how to do it. And then once that goes, it usually, like <clears throat> now that I've gotten, like all of the things that I do in my work regularly now, I developed on that piece. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that I use the resins and fabric intertwined with the glass, yeah. the way that I work with the glass in a lot of ways, the way I attach things, the way I build structures, it all started with that sculpture. Right. So it was like a big, um, it was a really big learning curve. Yeah. And, but a lot of it, there was a lot of stuff, I said it took me three months to make that piece, there was a lot of trial before that, mm -hmm. that were tests that weren't necessarily for that piece, but were for that, cons or that yeah. um, way of making it. And uh, that was, I think that just took me my whole career to figure out, it was like. So it's an extremely uh, creative process in terms of, yeah. uh, but also as well as being creative, I take it, it takes a long time. Yeah. Like, like you said, you thought about that for an entire summer. Yeah, before yeah. You, before you even and that was switched on, on the torch, effectively. Yeah, and I was building off everything I'd done before. So that was like all of the skills that I'd already learned. It's like that's there. And then I had to rethink how to, to use them and, and how to adapt them. So that's one of the things. Like the, the older that I get, the more experience I have, the yeah. more I'm able to do these things. Yeah. But it's often built off of mistakes and experiments and, and these. But that piece was, for me, very much, it was like a, it's a, it's a milestone yeah. for me. It's one that I still really... It's like, amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I still would, would love you, it. Ha, um, have you ever been offered money for it? I don't, I don't want to know how much or anything, but have you ever? Yeah, I've had a Have you thought about selling it, or is it one you'll always? It's for sale uh, it through for sale. through the gallery. Yes, and it's okay. it's going. It's it will be in France, I believe, in uh, Mousvert all next year. Okay. Um, I'm really hoping that they'll buy it. Actually. Uh, <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> hint, hint. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 been it's gone through a range of sale prices as well. Um, yeah. It was one price early on, uh, which was way too low. And now that it's shown in like that piece has been in probably ten countries, I think a lot of exhibitions, and it's been featured in magazines and books. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been it's been around, and now it's kind of hit that. It's got a price tag on it that kind of reflects that, which is yeah. nice. Um, yeah, and it's it's something I would actually I would love to sell because I would love to I would love it to be in a collection of a museum. I would love yeah. it to be something that people could go see. Yeah. I think a lot of the larger work, the larger sculptures, I would much rather have in a public collection than a private collection. Yeah, I was just going to say something like that. If that gets locked away mm -hmm. in some private collector's own house, gallery, museum, garage, yeah. it's it's a real shame. That that kind of needs to be on a public display because it's so unique. Like you say, well, I like the way you described it. It's funny, it's sad, it's serious, it's happy, it's saying all these statements, it's not saying anything at all. It kind of does everything what I believe art should do, which is challenge, get people to think, stop, look, listen, like, not like. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what I've kind of learned over the years about artwork, that you, know, you, don't, you don't have to like it to like it. Yeah, that piece I've gotten reactions. I mean, I had death threats from that piece when I showed it in Poland. Somebody, I can understand why. And uh, I had uh, like people be really upset about it, telling me like really aggressively telling me how great McDonald's is because of the Ronald McDonald House, which like was what I was critiquing. The fact that like one of the ways that they're utilizing, you know, like it's almost like when a company gets so big, it can help the poor little people down here. When actually, why do we need to have a company that big to do that? Yeah. But I've had the same at the same time. Um, 
another person who's had a completely different outlook on it because they spent a lot of time on a Ronald McDonald house because their kid also had, had um, uh, a traumatic injury yep. and they felt it was soothing. So it's like a whole different yep. range of emotions. And I remember when I was working on that piece, it was in the, at our studio in Illinois. Uh, I was going to grad school then. Where, where did you actually make that? Would I made that in Illinois uh, yeah. when I was doing my MFA at Illinois State. So yeah. it was like one of my, like my second, or it was my, one of my major projects through my whole yeah. Yeah. Um, grad school. Like when I went into it, I was already a working artist. Like I was already a professional artist. I would say working artist. I don't know if I'd call myself a professional at that point, but I was a working artist. Yep. And I went in like, I'm going to create, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not there. I didn't feel like I was there just to learn, to like learn how to be, I didn't want to learn how to make art. I wanted to learn how to be an artist. Yep. And that was, I think the distinct difference between like the way the programs run. I think they focus more on how you should be an artist rather than how, uh, how you should like, create as an artist rather than how you should be an artist. And I went in with an idea of I want to be a professional and this is what I was going to do. So everything I did, yeah. I did at a level of a professional. I showed a lot. I was lucky that I had other great students there and my faculty was really supportive because yeah. that wasn't like a yeah. not, not the way everybody approached it. I think finding, I mean, you, a few minutes ago you said, you know, with the level of experience you've now got, you know, you, you can fast pace these things. You're probably looking forward to the future to see what, you, what knowledge you have now will develop in the future. But I think it's a fine line to get there. Yeah. It, it, you know, you could have ended up going, you know, on a UPS management system. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Training program, <laughs> which, what a shame that would have been. So, you know, it, it, I think it is a fine line that people tread. Um, so I'm glad there's people like yourself in the world that, you know, do it the hard way. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I was lucky to have a lot of support from a lot of friends uh, and, and in the glass community itself, like really a ton of people just pushed me when... Yeah, I've seen that on this side. I mean, my background is obviously more commercial on glass and things rather than... It, it's only really since meeting yourself, I've been kind of adjusting to knowing people here, but I do see the, the, the working together, mm -hmm. the, the support network, you know, staying behind, having a few drinks and things like that, and the, the, not a party element, but, you know, the, the social side to it as well. Yeah. And I've been kind of really impressed with, with that community. Like, not... You know, it's not like... There's obviously there's an element of competition, I would yeah. imagine, but it's like a healthy competition. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's always going to be, you know, it's like a family, so there's always going to be issues, and there's yeah. always going to be people you end up not driving with over, over long, yeah, long, you know, long term, time. whatever, yeah. or ever, but like, for the most part, like, it's, it's, it's a supportive community. And yes, there is, of course, there's, uh, there's competitiveness, but like, that competitiveness can, it can either debilitate you or it can pull you forward, and I think for yeah. most people, it's a, it's there to pull you forward. It's not there, yeah. like to say, oh, I did this and you didn't do it. It's that's not. I mean, there's of course people like that, but that's not most people. Of I mean, uh, the, the collaborations I've seen you working on, uh, whether it's either seeing it through your Instagram account or, uh, through, you know, live demonstrations and things. It seems to be you have a. I think going back to what I was talking about a few minutes ago, for you to be able to sit there with someone for two hours, yeah, running materials that can kill people at the temperatures that you're working at and stay focused, you've got to have that element of connectivity and friendship. I don't think two strangers could come together and make a success of a piece. Yeah. Oh, you'd be surprised. I mean, as long as you're in, the, as long as you're in that, that thing, so, yeah. Then so long as they're not enemies. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, that's what I would say. Everybody like I worked with on Blown Away, they were all strangers. Like the, 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 competitor, the competitors not, but the, the, the assistants, yeah. I didn't know any of them going in. And a lot of times when I do stuff, you go there and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm meeting this person for the first time. But because you're part of that community, you're in the, you know you're all going to be in it full. And that's the big thing. Like, if you're an assistant for somebody, you're never going to go out of your way to do something to hurt them. Yeah. It's like you want their piece to survive because that's what we do. 